Uh, I was asked to talk about um, you know, predicting the future, which is always uh, difficult to do. Um, you know, ordinarily in the operating room, uh, this is the situation. The anesthesia team is, uh, is holding us up. Uh, this time the surgeon is holding up the meeting, and I apologize for the uh, airlines uh, uh, getting me here late. I appreciate the meeting organizer's uh, flexibility in uh, moving my talk uh, to today. Uh, I was asked to talk about uh, models and algorithms for predicting outcome for renal cell carcinoma. And of course, the prototypical model is TNM staging, which Dr. Fitzpatrick talked about yesterday. Uh, TNM staging actually does a fairly good job of stratifying patients. But TNM staging is basically an anatomic uh, uh, extent of disease uh, description, and it's probably better for uh, you know communicating the extent of disease than accurately predicting prognosis. And in fact, in the most recent version of the TNM staging manual, uh, they uh, put a caveat in there that integrated staging systems that look at other prognostic features uh, can provide more accurate prognosis. And of course, there are many, many features that we know can add to uh, anatomic extent of disease to improve uh, prognostication. Unfortunately, nobody agrees on which factors are the most important. So if you have a favorite prognostic feature that I, I neglect to mention today, I apologize. When I did a literature search recently on this topic to prepare for this paper, if you uh, try to narrow it down and you look at just the last uh, decade or so, there's well over 600 manuscripts that have some sort of uh, improvement in prognostication to renal cell carcinoma as the basis of the manuscript. The floodgates sort of opened for this in 1999 with Dr. Mozer's score looking at uh, the uh, outcome for patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. There were models prior to this, but uh, the, the accelerated pace of models uh, started with Dr. Mozer setting the trend. And I'm sure everybody in the audience is very, very familiar with this model and all the subsequent iterations that have come forth. And the interesting thing about this is it's based on uh, patient-specific factors uh, rather than tumor-specific factors, so performance status, anemia, calcium, LDH. Uh, these uh, patient-specific factors are highly predictive for outcome in patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And the important thing to recognize is that the features of the model depend upon the patient population you're looking at and on the endpoint. And the reason that the Mozart criteria are uh, valuable in patients with metastatic renal cell carcinoma is because the tumors are actually fairly homogenous if you compare them to a cohort of patients with localized disease. Everybody is high grade, everybody is high stage, so those features don't enter into a model and patient-specific factors are much more important. In localized renal cell carcinoma, tumor-specific factors are much more important. So what are those factors? Well. Tumor grade is an important factor. Unfortunately, there is still no international consensus on how we grade patients, but no matter how you do it, it's prognostic. We know that histology has an impact on outcome, and we know that uh, papillary and chromophobe are different from clear cell. There's debate about whether or not it's an independent prognostic factor. There's multiple papers published on this subject, and I still think there's no consensus. In our data, if you look at patients and you stratify by histologic subtype, there's a dramatic difference in survival at 15 years with 56% survival for non-cystic clear cells versus 85 and 84 for papillary and chromophobe. If you do a multivariable analysis adjusting for TNM stage, grade, and histologic necrosis, clear cell patients are still twofold more likely to die. Tumor necrosis is an important feature. And, uh, you know, Dr. Fakara presented yesterday the data from the Saturn project, which showed that papillary uh, in their hands uh, was uh, significantly different for necrosis versus no necrosis. In our hands, uh, necrosis is only significant for clear cell and chromophobe. So that's a, a matter of open debate still. Clearly, if you have a patient with clear cell and chromophobe uh, that has tumor necrosis, the outcome is worse. 
Sarcomatoid differentiation, it doesn't matter what the underlying histologic subtype is. Sarcomatoid differentiation is universally bad. And uh, very few patients with sarcomatoid renal cell carcinoma are long-term survivors. So how do you choose a tool for predicting outcome? Well, again, you have to choose a tool based on the patient population you're looking at what is the uh, relevance of the tool to your individual patient population, and what is the endpoint you're looking at. And very frequently, people use the wrong tool for uh, predicting the, uh, the outcome of interest. And I think the most important thing is, when you sit with a patient, you have to instruct them that these tools are not good for discriminating on the individual patient level. These tools are good for looking at populations of patients. I'm going to go very quickly through one of our algorithms just to tell you how these things are constructed. And it doesn't really matter if it's an algorithm or a nomogram or a score or what you call it. The basic principle for how you uh, make one of these is the same. So it helps if you have a registry and you don't have to review charts. And if you look retrospectively at numerous features, what we typically do is just figure out what is uh, predictive univariately and those features are then put into a multivariable model. The regression coefficients from the multivariable model for the features that were significant are converted to a score or a nomogram or some other feature which stratifies the patients. This happens to be our progression-free survival score um, that was published in uh, Cancer, uh, which some people call the Leibovitch score. Uh, just so you know, at Mayo, we don't call it the Leibovitch score. We call it the PFS score. And, uh, We've never assigned my name to this, so I appreciate those of you that refer to it that way, but uh, we just call it the PFS score. And it nicely stratifies patients into multiple bins based on their risk of, of having metastases after treatment for localized renal cell carcinoma. There are innumerable models to predict outcome, and uh, these are a few. So if you look at the uh, outcome prediction for post-surgery features, uh, pathologic features, performance status, uh, you pick the model, different features. The outcome prediction is not bad. Somewhere in the uh, high 70 to low uh, to mid 80 percent for concordance index. So concordance index of 0 0.5 is equal to flipping a coin, and one would be perfect predictive accuracy. Unfortunately, what we really need are models that tell us what to do with a patient preoperatively. And here's a bunch of uh, models that look at preoperative patient characteristics. Again, we can get up to mid 80% range uh, in some of the better models for accuracy. Perhaps more relevant to many people in this audience are uh, models that are specific to metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And there are so many that this table is split up into multiple slides. But I think what I'd like to point out is that the concordance indices for the models for metastatic renal cell carcinoma are quite poor relative to those for localized renal cell carcinoma, 67%, 63%, and a few in the mid-70 range. So the problem with the patients with metastatic disease is we are not good at predicting outcome relative to patients with local disease. So remember that the patients, the patient populations, and the disease itself are very heterogeneous. And the next question is, how can we do better? Well, what everybody says is, well, we need to look at molecular models. That's, that's the real answer. And there are many molecular uh, prognostic factors that we know of. The question is, can they actually help the situation? We looked at this uh, in our series, and we looked at three molecular markers, B7H1, Survivin, KI67, and again, using the same methods, developed a scoring system for those markers. And the scoring system, looking at just molecular markers, does stratify patients well. The question is, does it really make things better? And the answer is probably not. So the Kaplan-Meier plots on the left are looking at the UISS stage system, and on the right, the sign score from our institution. No matter what, adding the bio score to the existing models can improve prognostication, but only if you first collapse the groups into low intermediate and high risk. If you look at the full sign score, 
and you don't collapse the groups, uh, it is actually better at providing an accurate prognosis than adding these uh, molecular markers. So sign score added bio score increases the Corns index only slightly, but if you look at the full sign score, there's no improvement. And in fact, the concordance indices for other uh, molecular marker models have not shown any better concordance indices than we get with the traditional models, either preoperative or postoperative. There are a bunch of models that are useful for special circumstances. So, you know, uh, this is a model from Mayo looking at the sign score over time. And we've all had the experience of a patient coming back three or four years after they've been uh, treated with a nephrectomy, and maybe they were at high risk, but they've been free of disease for a while. Well, we know that those patients uh, that survive already a few years are less likely to progress than those patients that progress initially. So this model basically looked at uh, what happens over time for the people that have already been disease-free for an interval. And you just pick the post-operative disease-free interval. If somebody's been free of disease for two years already and their sign score was five and you want to know their five-year survival, you can look that up. It takes into account the fact that people that have survived already are more likely to survive long-term. For papillary RCC, the prognostic features are different than for clear cell and we have specialty models for predicting outcome in papillary renal cell carcinoma with very good concordance index. We have models to predict the likelihood of positive lymph nodes. This is one from our institution. Not so great in clinical practice, to be honest, because it's all pathologic features, but it does a good job of stratifying patients Probably a better way to do it is to look at preoperative features. So this is pooled data from multiple institutions looking at multiple features, which provides a nomogram that can tell us preoperatively the likelihood of having nodal metastases and perhaps relevant for planning surgery. We have multiple models, as Dr. Fakara alluded to, for predicting renal mass complexity, allowing us to compare a series of partial nephrectomy and make decisions about partial versus radical nephrectomy. And the one that we use actually most frequently is one to help us determine how frequently and with what tests we should follow patients after therapy for renal cell carcinoma. So we assign an abdominal score and a thoracic score and look at uh, abdominal recurrence and thoracic recurrence on separate tables. And this tells us what sort of interval to perform imaging and what imaging modalities are best based on the risk of recurrence in the abdomen or the thorax. So uh, in summary, these are frequently used for patient counseling, but I think you have to be very careful because these are only truly useful and truly accurate on large populations of patients, not at the individual level. Determination of relative risk of patient populations is a much better use for this when we are looking at uh, treatment efficacy across patient populations, helps us to guide surgical decisions and, uh, and treatment approaches. These are definitely useful for trial design and stratification and for developing surveillance programs. Perhaps most important, these models have shown us which are the important prognostic factors. In the future, what we need most is uniform collection of data. I would love the ability to uh, validate the Mozart criteria, but we don't have some of those features in our registry. So clearly, we need to get everybody together and determine what features need to be included in our databases as we move forward. I think we need a model to predict those patients that will rapidly progress after a cytoreductive nephrectomy. We have difficult uh, decision making right now for that patient population. We need, we need better models to predict response to therapy. We have some. And perhaps genotyping, in addition to some of our uh, current prognostic features, will, will prove to provide uh, added prognostic stratification. I'd like to thank uh, the meeting organizers again for letting me speak today rather than yesterday. And uh, appreciate uh, your attention. Thank you.